This is our second lecture covering Chapter 6, and in this part, we're going to talk about the normal and the standard normal distribution. First, I'm going to cover some general properties of a normal distribution. They're going to apply to any distribution, whether it's the standard normal distribution or otherwise. Then we'll focus a bit on answering some probability questions surrounding the standard normal distribution. Then we'll see how you can use the z-scores for any normal distribution to answer probability questions using the standard normal distribution, which is routinely tabulated. The normal probability distribution. In general, the normal probability distribution is probably one of the most important distributions in all of statistics. It's a distribution that's used in the derivation also of many other important distributions, such as the chi-squared distribution or the F distribution. We'll see some of those distributions later. It's widely used in statistical inference, particularly if you have a, a large sample, you can often use the normal distribution in order to do things like hypothesis testing and undertake other statistical inference uh, uh, that we will talk about later in this course. It's widely used in a variety of applications in statistics, you know, including uh, the distribution of heights of people in a population, rainfall amounts tend to be normally distributed, test scores are often normally distributed. For example, if you look at IQ test scores, they've been studied extensively. They tend to follow a normal distribution. Many scientific measures in the natural world and in economics as well tend to follow a normal distribution. De Moore, uh, a French mathematician, is credited with deriving the normal distribution in 1733. Interesting piece of information. I think it's also true, but you would check this, but I think it's also true that, that he was an orphan, if I remember correctly. I've read several textbooks on the history of mathematics, and I believe that his story is really interesting because he got off to a pretty rough start in life be before becoming a very well-known and accomplished mathematician. Here's the formula for the normal probability distribution. This, of course, is the, the probability density function. We use the word density to remind us that we're talking about a continuous random variable. And this formula can be used in order to calculate probabilities that x takes on a value in between two values uh, that are possible for the variable to, um, to assume. You would want to use an integral of this function in order to calculate the areas between two different values uh, under the standard normal distribution. For example, if you were looking at two points A and B and you were interested in knowing the area or the probability, you would integrate between A and B. Now there are two issues here. First is that calculus is, is not required in this statistics class, so you know, it's hard for me to talk about integrals. But the other thing is, is that you actually can not integrate this function. Um, so uh, what's done typically is that it's kind of estimated numerically and then tabulated. So you can find standard normal tables in the back of almost any uh, statistics textbook. And also computer packages like Excel or R or Python all have built-in normal and standard normal uh, distribution functions that make it very easy to calculate these probabilities. So doing the integration isn't really necessary. Within this formula, I would just point out that mu stands for the population mean. Of course, we have the standard deviation. We've got pi, which you should know is equal to 3.14. And I'm sure you also know that E um, is equal to 2.718. That is the, the natural uh, base E. Um, so here are some characteristics of the probability distribution. Any probability distribution is going to be perfectly symmetric. The mean is going to be sort of right in the middle here. And there's going to be as much area on the left as there is on the right. So the area that's under the curve on the right-hand side of the mean is equal to the area that's under the curve on the left-hand side of the mean. So there's no skewness whatsoever. The skewness measure is zero. The entire family of normal probability distributions, then, 
given the symmetry, are defined by basically just two different uh, parameters of the standard normal distribution, and that is the mean and the standard deviation. So the mean here is right in the middle, and then you have the standard deviation. Typically, the standard deviation is going to be written up here in the right-hand corner of, of the picture. So if you go back and look at the formula, if you go back just a couple of slides, we can do that. We'll go back two slides. You will notice in this formula that the only thing that would distinguish one normal probability density function from another is the standard deviation here and the mean here. Right? Those are the only two parameters that determine or distinguish one normal probability density function from another one. The highest point on a normal probability distribution is the mean. So the mean would be right here. And of course, given that there's no skewness, we have a perfectly symmetric distribution. The mean is going to be equal to the median, and it will be unimodal. There will be no, this is not a bimodal distribution. There's just one mode right at the mean. So the mean is equal to the median because the distribution is skewed neither to the left nor to the right. And earlier we, we have studied in this course the relationship between the mean, the mean, the median, and the measure of skewness. Of course, we've already looked at this as well, but I will remind you that the empirical rule applies to any bell-shaped symmetric distribution like the normal distribution. You have the mean in the middle. You've seen exactly this graph before, but I'll remind you that 68.26% percent of the observations will lie within one standard deviation of the mean, 95.44 will lie within two standard deviations of the mean, and virtually all of the observations will lie within three standard deviations of the mean. The standard normal probability distribution has the following characteristics. It is a very special normal probability distribution where we set the mean equal to zero and the standard deviation equal to one. We could really, you'll see, we could take any normal probability distribution, and if we calculate z-scores for all the different values of the random variable, then we will normalize it to a distribution that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, which makes it very convenient to use the standard normal distribution to answer probability questions about any other normal probability distribution. All we have to do is transform values back and forth between z-scores. So here's a graph of the standard normal distribution. It looks exactly like our other graph of the normal distribution, except we specified that the standard deviation is equal to 1. We've specified that the mean is equal to 0, and we've labeled the horizontal axis here as z instead of x to remind us that these are, in fact, standardized values or z-scores. We're going to come back to this graph in a minute. I want to show you how to answer probability questions using a standard normal table. There are also functions in Excel that I expect you to know, but I don't typically cover the Excel functions in these video lectures. We can cover those separately. All of the functions that you need are described in detail at the end of the chapter notes for each chapter. We're going to answer each one of these questions in turn. We're going to kind of go back and forth between this slide, the slide before it, and the slide that's after it. So the first question here is going to be the simplest type of question. We're going to uh, look at the probability that a value of z is less than or equal to 1.55. All we have to do is look up the area in a table. So let me go back for just a second. Let me show you what we're looking for. So somewhere in this table, we've got 1.55. Let's say this is our value of 1.55. It's going to be hard for me to write that with my, my little pen here. It's not that easy to use. But there's 1.55. And what I've asked here is I've asked, what, uh, what is the probability that z is less than that figure? So what I'm looking for here is the area that's to the left of that value under the curve. Now, like I said, areas under the curve represent probabilities. And when you have continuous random variables, that implies integration. The standard normal uh, probability density function can't really be integrated, but like I said, you can just go to a table in order to find these areas. 
That's exactly what the standard normal table that I'm going to show you next tabulates. It tabulates the area to the left of any value of z. Let's take a look at that. So we've got 1.55. We can go to a table like this, and we can look up 1.55. Let's see if I can find that. Here's 1.5, and then here's 0.5. So 1.55, tricky on my eyes but it looks like 0.9394. So 0.9394 then is the area that's to the left. So 0.9394 is the answer to the question. Okay, let's answer the next question. In order to answer the next question, let me uh, go here and I will erase all the ink on this slide and I will erase the ink on this slide. We will answer the next question. What is the probability that z is greater than or equal to minus 1.8? So here z takes on a negative value, which implies that this value of z is below the mean. Remember, the mean for the standard normal is, is at zero. So going back up here, we'll look for minus 1.8. I don't know, maybe minus 1.8 is in here somewhere. Minus 1.8. Okay. And what this asks is it asks for the probability that z takes on a value that's greater than minus 1.8. So I'm looking for this area out here to the right. Now this is where it's important to remember that what the table is going to give us is it's going to give us this area that's to the left. But we know that the total area under the curve is equal to 1. So once we find the area that's to the left, we can simply subtract it from 1 in order to get the area that's to the right of 1.8. So let's complete that exercise. We're going to go to our table, and now we're going to look up minus 1.8. So let's see, minus 1.8. Here's minus 1.8. In this column, we have 0. Nothing in the hundreds place there. So it looks like the answer is 0 0.0359. So 0 0.0359. But remember that we're looking to, for the area that's to the right. And 0 0.0359 is the area that's to the left. But we know the total area is equal to 1, so 1 minus 0 0.0359 gives us 0 0.9641, and that's the answer. 96.41% of the values under the standard normal curve are greater than minus 1.8. There you go. Now the next thing that we can ask is probability questions that ask us to look for the probability that z is between two values. And again, we just need the area under the curve. But we need the right area under the curve. Okay, so between minus 1.8 and 1.55, what would that look like here? Well, let me show you. So we'll erase all of that ink. We have minus 1.8. Here's our value, minus 1.8. Okay. And then the other value that we were looking at is at 1.55. So that's out here somewhere. 1.55. And we want the probability that a value of z is between these two values. Okay. So if we look up 1.55 in the table, we're going to get this whole area here. That whole area that's to the left of 1.55. <coughs> Excuse me. We don't want that area, but that's, that includes the area that we want. What we want to do is get rid of the area that I'm cross-hatching to the left of minus 1.8, which is exactly what the table gives us, right? So if we look up the table value for 1.55, we subtract out the table value for 1 point, uh, minus 1.8, we'll be left with exactly the area that we're looking for, which is the area between minus 1.8 and 1.55, and that will give us the probability that z takes on a value between minus 1.8 and 1.55 on the upper end. Now, we've already calculated these probabilities just to move things along a little bit faster and make the problem convenient. I picked the same z-scores that we used in the first two questions. So we've got 0.9394, which we read directly off of the table in answering the first question. And then we need to subtract out the area that's to the left of minus 1.8. We calculated that in the previous step up here, right, as point. 0.0359, so we subtract out that 0.0359, and we're left with the answer, 
The answer is 0 0.9035. Okay, next. The last type of question that's important to be able to answer is what I like to call an inverse question. In the table, if you look at the table, what we've been doing is we've been looking up z-scores and then going to the middle of the table in order to find the associated probability. Sometimes you want to work problems like that in reverse. In other words, you're given an area that's under the curve or you know an area that's to the left or to the right of a particular value and you want to know, well, you know, what's the z-score that's associated with that area. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to do a problem where we're going to look for the z-score such that 15% of the x values are expected to be greater. Okay, so if we're going to do this, what we need to remember is that the table gives us areas to the left, not to the right. So we want 15% of the area left in the right tail. So we're looking for some value of z. We don't know what it is yet. But there's some value of z for which 15% of the area, 0.15, is left in the right tail. See? But the table gives us this area. We have to keep that in mind. Right? That's the table. The table's going to give us that area. So what we need to do is we need to subtract the 0.15 from 1, since the area under the curve is equal to 1 and then look up the associated value in the table. So that's what I've done here. 1 minus 0.15 is equal to 0.85. Then I'm going to go to the table, and I'm going to look up 0.85 in the middle of the table, and then read out to the margins to get my z-score. So it could take a little bit of hunting through the table, uh, but you know, the answer here is, is 1.04. Let's verify 1.04 is at least very close to 0.85. Uh, in terms of the area that's to the left of 1.04 under the standard normal curve. So we're going to just verify the answer here. 1.04. 1.04 out in the hundreds plates. That's 0 0.8508, but that was the closest value. Uh, so one point. Oh, four. Right there, we have it. So we verify that the answer is correct. But in answering this question, to be clear, I search through the table to find this value first. And then I write out to the margins in order to get the z score. 